Uh, so, um, my name is Brett Payton, and I'm the, uh, uh, the technology director for Better or For Worse at Multiply.com. Um, we are based uh, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and uh, we are an old school pearl shop. And what do I mean by that? Uh, just about everything that we do is written in Perl. Um, with a few exceptions, we've got uh, some load balancing modules uh, written in C that run on Apache, and uh, um, uh, another uh, network model that runs on C, but everything else is Perl, from, from the web server to the cache management to reporting to system monitoring. Every, everything is pretty much Perl. Um, if you're not familiar with Multiply, we are a social network. Um, we started in about uh, December 2003. Uh, we got uh, eventually around 27 million in funding, and um, we got something like 18 million registered users, and we're doing a fair amount of traffic. Uh, about two million photos were uploaded to us a day, 20,000 videos, and uh, it was very popular in Southeast Asia for reasons that remain inexplicable to us to this day. Um, in the end, of course, Facebook won, but uh, we managed to, to get out with a pretty nice exit. A uh, multinational company in, in South Africa bought us um, because of our presence in, in uh, Southeast Asia and our popularity with people that were doing online stores. Uh, we don't have shopping cart capabilities, but they were still using our photo sharing to like, set up their stores and, and display their stores, so that it worked out very well for us. But uh, um, we're in the process of sort of converting our site, but the one thing that we did do and what we were doing primarily was serving out images. Um, and that's what uh, this talk is on, is uh, how we stored um, about two petabytes, uh, two billion images and served them out on a daily basis. Um, and this is, uh, we called it the Multiply Golden Storage System. <laughs> um, it had one primary design goal, which is to make everybody happy. Um, and what I mean by that, uh, it needs to be fast to make customers happy. They want to get their images quick. They're not going to sit around and wait. Um, it needs to be inexpensive. Uh, we need to make, our, to make our investors happy and to keep us uh, going. Uh, it needs to be simple so that developers would use it and not try to code around it. And then obviously, it needs to be reliable so that, uh, you know, if I upload images of my kids, I'm going to want to come back in a year or two years, and I expect to be able to see them and be able to share them. So it needs to be reliable, be able to return those images uh, because I trust you to hold them. Um, that system has essentially two tiers. Uh, one is the, the gold, what we call the golden cache. Um, that's the place where we actually serve the images out through the web server to the customer. And then the uh, other side of it is called the golden, which is the permanent storage of multiple copies of the image. So obviously, you know, if, if I'm going to go to the website and fetch an image, we'll pull it from our, our golden storage, put it in the cache, and serve it to the customer. So there's two tiers. Um, some of the basic stats that the, the system was, um, was doing, it uh, has about two petabytes, uh, 1.8 petabytes of online storage. Uh, in it right now are two billion, some original photos. We have uh, 40 million videos and 60 million other documents. Uh, you can take a guess what those other documents are. Um, some basic upload stats, we get about um, one to two, we got about one to two terabytes a day at our peak which is, translates to 2 million photos and about 20,000 videos. Um, the golden, um, this is some just basic stats from the golden stats. This is the golden system actually houses the original images, not the, uh, the cached smaller versions that people would see on their web browsers. Um, it would, uh, we get about 7 million files fetched from that system per day and put into cache. That's about 3.2 terabytes of raw data. Um, and the system was capable of fetching a 450 450k file and write it into the cache in about 115 milliseconds on average. Um, some of some of the cache's basic stats is the cache. This is the part that actually has the smaller images and thumbnails that actually get served out to the customer. Um, it got about uh, 50 million hits, uh, 50 million images a day were served out of it. We peaked at uh, 800 megabit, uh, megabits per second, um, and it would take it takes anywhere between 100 and 180 milliseconds to serve an image. So. Controlling costs of this large system is very, very important, and uh, the cost is pretty much driven by the number of spinning disks. Um, so what we needed to do to build the system and to keep it inexpensive was, A, to find the least um, expensive, reliable disk arrays that we could. This is commodity hardware. We're buying a Dell MD1000s with a Dell 2950 head unit, you know, just off-the-shelf stuff. And then we used open source tools and our proprietary code to manage the whole process. So it was a lot of pearl, a lot of glue um, to sort of 
manage caches and store things and back things up in such a way that we could use this commodity hardware. So we did a price comparison for uh, Kodak um, once where we wanted to do the total cost of ownership. You know, this included amateurization of hardware, it includes bandwidth costs, it includes developers, and all, anything that we could you know, pile in, and then we compared it to Amazon S3. And this was a year ago, so the prices may have changed, but at that time we were, be, we were able to store um, a terabyte per year at $620 compared to 15, or 1500 and 1600 bucks at Amazon S3. So we're able to do it very inexpensively, at least on the scale that we were at. So how does this work? Uh, if we go through all the sort of marketing side of that, um, this is a little slightly boring uh, technical part. Um, I'm just going to walk you guys through the process of how we, you know, how the stuff got put into the cache and how it was served out to the customers, um, as well as how it got backed up um, and all the sort of pearl parts that keep it all together. Um, and just before you start getting into all the gory technical details, I just want to do a, a quick word about file paths and our IDs. This is a convention that we've used for better or for worse. Our individual media, we don't have um, a numeric, unique numeric ID for our media. Our media is identified by the user ID. So when you sign up for an account with Multiply My User ID is Funasty, that becomes part of your ID. Um, the type of media, so video or photo, um, and then the sequence ID that's unique to me. So if I've got 14 photos or 14 photo albums, um, you know, I'll have one through 14 index IDs. And then the photo ID, so an individual photo that resides in an album, you know, again, one through 100 if I've got 100 photos in an album. Um, so that would end up looking something like, um, uh, I didn't actually do that one, but yeah, Foo Nasty Photos 286.12 would be sort of a unique identifier for a piece of media. And uh, that translates to a file path um, that includes the bucket, the first two, the first four characters of the user ID, the type, and the album ID, and blah, blah, blah. Just want to put this up here because you're going to see this convention used throughout the, the presentation, so it's not uh, confusing. That's how we identified our files. So. How, did, how do we get an image? How do we fetch an image out of our system? Um, and it begins, obviously, with a simple request, a simple HTTP request. It's almost a, a sort of like, it was designed to be almost like a very, very simple API. Each one of the, um, we use path info keys. So each one of the, this doesn't actually represent a URI, it's a, they're each individual arguments. So um, the domain name, um, which is your user account, is food nasty. Then the sequence ID, that, that's the number four there, that represents sort of the version of the um, um, image server so that we can have multiple, you can float these uh, URLs out there and can, they'll be backwards compatible for years because we've got a versioning system. It's also used in generating the secure token at the end. Followed by photos, then the album ID, the size. Uh, we support a wide range of sizes, I think five or six, maybe seven, eight different sizes. Um, <coughs> But if you're a client, it looks like the, the image, you can expand it, contract it, because we just serve the closest size that we can and then use some CSS magic to make it look like it's expanding and contracting. That way we don't have to keep every single possible size out there that someone wants to see. Um, then the image ID one, uh, plus there's a nice name that you can put on the end that's just kind of throw away, but it's there just so you can kind of see what the name of the image is. Uh, followed by a secure token that's, um, I mean, uh, an encrypted uh, collection or concatenation of a, a couple of the other uh, items in the URL so that we can verify that this is in fact a legitimate request that we created. So the first thing uh, that uh, this request do, does is it, it hits one of our, our caching servers. Um, and sort of the, the best way to describe uh, our caching servers, we have a, a collection of 20 or 30 so boxes. I don't think we even have just 12 right now. But they're just vanilla proxies. Uh, uh, they're running Apache, and they've got our, our load balancer written in C that Balaj wrote um, in it. And basically what they'll do is they'll take the first part of that request, the foo nasty, my user ID, and just use a, I'll skip to the next slide just to show, use a simple hashing algorithm that will take that user ID and hash it into one of 2,000 buckets. And then those individual buckets, we have what's known as a scoreboard file. And so those buckets are in, assigned, assigned to a server. Um, so my bucket 1291 was assigned to WS721. Um, the proxy will do that lookup and then know to pass all subsequent requests for FooNasty to that backend that has my cache. 
Um, caching servers can go down and the caches will get rebuilt because we'll, we'll say, okay, 1291, that server is down. We need to reassign that bucket to server Y. So that's how we would do the caching and balance the caches. Um, so the cache would, the, that request will first hit the, uh, the proxy cache or the, the caching server to collect the image. And um, usually the request, the vast majority of requests for images are not for the original, it's for some portion of the size, you know, a 12 by 12, a 1200 by 120, a 300 by 300, some size of the original image. And um, it would search the uh, directory, the directory system on the local ser server and try and fetch the plot. Uh, that's right ahead file name back there. So based on that um, URL request, we could construct the file path here and then just simply look for that file on the file system. And if it's there on the local file system, serve it out to the customer. Um, now, if we didn't have the file, we don't have one of those nice thumbnail sizes, we go to what we call the golden cache, which is a copy of the original pulled from our golden storage. And then we'll take that original and just resize it on the fly and then serve it out to the customer and resizing the image, you know, it's not, not magic, just we used image magic um, to simply resize the file, store it uh, in the local cache and, and, then, and then serve it out to the customer. Um, in addition to um, the, just the regular size caches, we also had um, this notion of a sort of a hyper-optimized thumbnails, which is basically a, a film strip of thumbnails. And one of our, you know, the most requested pages on our site is just an album page. Um, people, I believe, um, they were just as likely to look at, you know, click one time into a, into a photo album as to just look at all the thumbnails on a photo album. So that was one of our most popular pages. And consequently, if you've got 200 photos in your photo album, we're going to serve out 200 thumbnails. This is pretty expensive. So we came up with a way to condense those requests by creating a, a single image that we could serve once um, of the individual thumbnails. Then we would use CSS to sort of reposition that film strip for each individual one. We relied on the browser's cache to make only one request. <coughs> so we would reduce the, you know, I think we put them in strips of 10. Um, and so that reduced the request for thumbnails by a factor of 10. Um, so we would have, um, so in addition to those different size caches, we have this sort of hyper-optimized thumbnail cache that we also keep on the local disk. Um, this is a little pearl sample of how we sewed the images together. We didn't even, you know, use um, the image magic pearl wrapper. You just use convert on the command line, just to send it out that way, and build up, you know, create the thumbnail, and then put build up your film strip, and then save it to disk. Um, so managing the cache. Um, sorry about this slide. It's the last one I made this morning, and I, I didn't do so with the font color. Um, the um, the first way that we used to manage our cache is the original way is we used to use finds. Just run a find against the directory, find files that are older than 24 hours, and whack them. Find our end. That was not very smart. Um, hammered our disks. Um, and so we noticed sort, sort of performance fall fell off as we did more and more of these purges to save our space because our caches were filling up. So we just decided on a very simple solution which is simply to log the cache activity. So that if uh, a request comes in, serves a file, or has to generate the file, simply write to a log file that says, we serve this file with this file ID at this particular time. Um, and then there's a little process called uh, uh, update DB that runs, in, or uh, update GCDB, whatever, that just scans the uh, uh, log file on a periodic basis and uh, updates a database that we can then query without hammering the disk to know what's in our cache. Now this doesn't completely resolve all your problems. Uh, every once in a while we still have to run finds to like pick up lost images or things we didn't log properly if the log got corrupt or something like that. But you're, at least you're not hammering the disk every hour to find out what your older files are. Um, and the reason, that, one of the reasons that we did the, uh, the logging is just that we didn't want to have a database dependency. Um, for obvious reasons, I'm serving out a tiny little image. Last thing I want to do is waiting for an image just to be hung up on a database query. It also provides an audit trail for so when people screw up, when images go missing because they get purged um, and there was no backup of them, uh, we have an audit trail. We can point to this log and say, hey, the web server requested the file. It was there. The client got it. What happened to the file? So that's a pretty useful thing. Um, the update GCDB daemon just takes a, a use of, makes use of file tail um, so that 
we're constantly reading that, that log um, and putting it into the database so there's not too much latency there. Um, obviously, when you have as many requests as, as, uh, as we did, um, it was important to keep that information about the cache updated so that you could purge it properly and regularly. Um, and then this is, uh, this is intentional. Um, <laughs> the purge golden cache. Uh, process uh, is the uh, is the process that runs in the back ends that reads from that database and um, blows away the images if uh, they actually are backed up and that's we'll get to the part uh, about the fact that when we upload photos we actually store them in the cache first um, and which can lead to problems we're going to touch on that in a second so what happens if uh, you know we've got this great caching system but what happens when you miss the cache what happens when you have to go to this big monstrous, slow commodity disk system to pull files off there. Well, what we originally did is we did a directory screening. We literally mounted every single volume that we stored images on via NFS to all of our backends. And as you can imagine, this uh, might get a little big, and you would think it was slow, but as it turns out, uh, the way that we structure our files with the multiple levels of indirection with your bucket and the first two digits of the user ID and the second two digits of the user ID, blah, 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 go on and on, you have a lot of no-offs. Uh, if I've got 100 volumes mounted via NFS and I query and I said, hey, do you have this file? And they don't have that file and they probably don't have the directory above it and the directory above that and the directory above that, it takes 10 milliseconds. So you can actually mount quite a few volumes and scan for your files this way. No need for a central index. So we had a, process, uh, a little routine, sync from golden, pull the image off the golden, and it simply just went through the mount points and see if the file was there. If it was there, copy it. Just use CP. Well, this doesn't scale. Because if I have 100 volumes and I have, it takes me 10 milliseconds to scan a volume, and I have the great misfortune of being having my photo on the very end, it takes one second to find that photo. It's a little too slow. So we redesigned the system. And um, nothing earth shattering, but we, we were able to reuse uh, the, the, the hashing and uh, caching strategies that we used with the proxy servers here. And which is to simply, I look at my user ID, I use that hashing function to put my, uh, to determine what bucket my uh, photo is in. We'll look up on the scoreboard the shard location of an index that knows where my, based on my file ID, what volume my file is on. And so that's what we did. And uh, you, have a, you have a large sharded database that has, you know, knows all about all these files and has a volume ID. You can find the, uh, the, the file and then just do an HTT, HTTP fetch off the golden, particular golden volume and write it to the cache. Um, so the new sync from golden looks like this. Uh, send the file ID. It uh, takes that file ID, turns it into a bucket, uh, asks, you know, which which host is going to know uh, which MySQL host, you know, is responsible for bucket one two one nine. Uh, okay, it's this host over here. Connect to that host. Hey, what volume is uh, this particular file hosted on? It's hosted on volume Y. Fine. Uh, go to volume Y, and I'll use HTTP and, and fetch that image. This uh, this on average took about 20 milliseconds to do. So. Um, it's a little slower than the best case scenario, which is like if I scan to the volumes, I can find it in the first two. Um, but it's also much faster than the worst case scenario, which is, you know, I'm on volume 147, so it's going to take a half, minute or a second and a half to go find that for me. Um, um, so I'm running out of time, but uh, uh, uploads and storage. Um, just a quick word about how we, how we do that. Uh, when files are uploaded to our system, we have a variety of ways from um, a very simple HTML form with file upload to a Java applet to uh, a desktop client written in Air that Jeff wrote that scans your file system and uploads files. They all come on via Apache and are initially stored in that golden cache. Um, that, that same update, DD, update GCDB that scans the log to see what's in golden cache is also responsible for noticing when there's new files that are put in the cache. And those files need to be put onto the golden system. And they'll make a note of it in this database. Um, 
So what happens next is that uh, once, once they're in the database, there's a process that runs on each of our image ca caching servers where a file's been uploaded called Golden Backup D. And all it does, it's uh, written in Po, and it, it, queer it queries the database periodically once you know, every 30 seconds to see if there's new files. If there's new files of any size, it reports to a streaming server. And that streaming server has knowledge of all the volumes that are currently writable on our system. And it manages how many Golden Backup D processes can write to any given volume at any given time. And the reason you need this is we're using cheap commodity hardware. We've got 200 web servers that could have files uploaded to them. If they all decide to start writing to you know, volume A at the same time, volume A is going to crash. So you just have to have a little manager that sits in the middle that says, OK, um, you know, we can write 12 streams at once to this particular volume. We've got one volume online. Golden Backup D makes a request to me. OK, here, here's the stream. Go out, write that file to that particular volume. So it's a, that's how we write and keep that commodity hardware going. Um, to write the file, it's a simple put. Uh, believe it or not, it's a CGI. It's like five or six lines long. We literally take just do a, a put file, and here's the file ID, and then Apache running on the Golden Volume servers reads that file in, writes it to disk, and that's how we store them in multiple locations. Um, redundant. Department of Redundancy Department is my, one of my dad's favorite sayings. He was a, a COBOL programmer, and he loved to keep things duplicated everywhere. Uh, our system has multi, two copies of, at all times of each individual um, piece of media in two separate volumes. They're on RAID 5 disk arrays. There's hot spares on each RAID. There's two LAN heads on each unit, so that if any particular if a head unit fails, um, or if a volume is unavailable, there's multiple paths to get to that particular piece of data. Um, if for whatever reasons we have machine crashed, no. how about that? On the redundancy slide. Right, right at 1959 <laughs> too, which is 20 minutes, which is my limit, so it's like I got an automatic cutoff there. Um, yeah, but basically it, 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 we just went through the redundancy situations and we back up files. We've got a tape backup machine so that, you know, ultimate catastrophic failure happens, we at least have a tape backup of all the data that's done with a, a robot and uh, whatever software that comes with. But that's, that's basically it.